a question can represent like a hole, a, a, a gap in the reality that, that you've constructed around yourself or that we as a society have constructed. There's something, something driving you to move beyond, move beyond. So a quest. So I'd like to, to, to start with um, well, 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 I'll ask maybe five to ten people to simply call out a question, but not yet, because first I want to just tune us into the energy of the question, of the quest. And, and it could be, as I said, disturbance, or it could be curiosity. It could, like, something can be pushing you out of the old world. Something can be drawing you into a new world. So, usually, and usually both come at the same time. This is what's happened. I talked about this a bit last night. Like, you know, getting pushed out of the old school system, the old food system, the old healthcare system. Maybe some people, even the old money system, these are no longer hospitable. But it's not just that. We don't, we're not like desperate to claw our way back into the old normal because this whole time we've been beckoned by a new normal. So there's a push and a pull. And so the question has this element as well. So let's just take like a minute or two um, to not hurry, not hurry to put it into words, but feel the presence of a question in you. This discontinuity, this pull, this, this gap in reality. It may help to close your eyes, but take a couple minutes to feel the presence of a question. Don't hurry to the words. Feel the presence of a question. Yeah, and so now I, I just would invite um, some people to speak their question into the collective listening. Anyone is welcome to. And keep it trim. Okay? No, no, you don't need to, to context it because people will recognize the question. So don't even say, my question is. Just say the question, it'll become poetry. Yeah. Why am I here? Um, how to align desire with purpose. Mm. What are some mantras for balance? What is inquiry? Working through the heart. What's the function of liminality in our society right now? <laughs> Could you say that again? <laughs> What's the function of liminality in our society right now? I don't know what that word yeah. means. Oh, yeah. uh, space in between. So, okay. Yeah. 
What story can we tell the children? Mm -hmm. What story could I tell my mom? <laughs> the last two questions, could you repeat? What story can we tell the children, and what story can I tell my mom? Where do I go? Where are we going? Where are we going? <laughs> Exploring crisis is opportunity. How do we get there? How do we get to where we want to be? What actions can we take? How do we love when trauma meets trauma? What is progress? <laughs> what is truly efficient? Will there be concentration camps for unvaccinated people? <laughs> what is this crisis revealing about our inner self? Where's the juiciness? <clears throat> How do I trust and let go when so much feels scary? Mm -hmm. In what ways can storytelling be transformed to tell a new story? What structures are emerging and what is my role in building them? How to face a monster without becoming a monster. Mm -hmm. How to truly celebrate. How do we how do we remember who we truly are? How to move from pain to pleasure. How to move from pain to pleasure. What is my fortification? What is my fortification? How do we love without borders? How do we keep balance as we move from having one foot in each world to bringing both feet into the new world? How do we sustain the enthusiasm for these like desires that we have, you know, throughout generations? How do we stay connected and support one another? How do we not fall prey to divisiveness? Even as I say, firm in my truth. Working, <clears throat> working in a healthy way with fear. Yay. Yeah, thanks. So I'm hearing a lot of things in these questions. Um, many of them, maybe more than half, were not actually questions. They were something else in disguise. They were something that is in you to express. And you put it in the form of, of a question. But actually, there is a truth that you have seen that wants to be heard. Uh, others were actual questions coming from a place of, of unknowing, of surrender. And you can feel, you can, you can hear the, uh, a different tone to those questions. So, if there's anything that you heard, especially that has that feeling tone, then maybe we can use that to um, open my channel and see what comes, since I am sitting up here <laughs> in this role. Can I ask you a question? Yeah. What, uh, what resonated most with you that you heard? In... Um, well, what about your mom? And the, so a lot of the how do we questions or the how do I questions, those are also another, those are something in disguise, but they're not, they are a question. They're another question in disguise of that question. Uh, and that's coming from a, uh, a deep-seated habit in our society of framing things in how to, of 
turning a question into a how, how to question. Mm -hmm. Very often, it's not actually the right question. It's not the real question. Um, usually, because usually, either you already know how, or knowing how is not necessary to get to where you're going. And, and like this habit of, okay, like give me step-by-step -step instru instructions. Tell me what to do. This is something that a lot of us learned in school. And, and, and like how am I going to know better than you how to do something when it's, when it's you? Like, so, so, so I'm interested in, in what is underneath those how-to questions. And if you ask me those, um, I can listen for what's underneath it and respond to that as well. So, yeah, those are the questions that are speaking to me right now. Um, would anybody like to bring, bring one of those forward? <laughs> How to okay. surrender when it feels so scary. How to surrender when it feels so scary. Yeah. So do you have a body memory of surrendering when it feels scary? It's like, I don't, not a conscious one that I think of, but just the conscious agreement to hold the space for this was so scary, and it's so good. <laughs> <laughs> like, why? Why am I so scared of the so good? <laughs> and what blocks that? <laughs> Yeah, so I think surrender, surrender is not something that you can force yourself to do. It's, it's really different than all of the other doings that our society uh, upholds. It's not, surrender is not an accomplishment. The ego would like to make it into an accomplishment. But it's, 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 it's kind of an anti-accomplishment. So, and like you can see the benefits that come from it. Like it's obvious. Like everyone's experienced the benefits that come from surrender. Um, whether it's in childbirth or artistic creation, music, love, life, I mean, we see the benefits from it. So what I would say is, is, to, is to revisit the moment of surrender and not so like, okay, I'm gonna do this again next time, but to revisit that moment because, and, and like honestly, like to, to, to go back there and uh, because when you give it attention, it imprints more deeply on you and you become familiar with that territory. Yeah, because like when I surrender to something, it usually is, it just kind of happens, you know? Sometimes there's a moment of fuck, I'm just gonna do it, you know? Like, I don't care. Like, I'm going for it, okay. It's time, that's another thing, it's time. It's just a recognition of it's time. Yeah, we make things hard, don't we? <laughs> a lot of the how-to questions are an attempt to make something hard that's actually easy. <laughs> it's like, I already know how to do this, so let me ask 
how. <laughs> yeah, I had a how-to question, but I kind of wanted to say, like, F it, when are we just going to, like, start this new society already? You know, like, have the revolution. Well, we already have. Yeah, like, that's what, yeah. That's when? What's interesting. We, like, we already. We are a part of the revolution right now, but, like, <laughs> establishing that to, like, this social body that is sort of, like, the greater society, I guess. What, what if I told you the hard part's already been done? Uh, <laughs> what, what, is, what is that hard part yeah, that's already been done? What's the hard part? The hard part is doing the things that we've been doing when it seemed utterly futile and hopeless and crazy and naive and irresponsible. Now look at how many people can't even have this level of knowledge. This was the Yeah. Yeah. I just said. Yeah. I just saw that something like the, the idea of people not being able to, like, that can't, people can't acknowledge it. Yeah. Right. It's different. Right. Uh, yeah, because that, that just made me think in that moment, like, like what is, what is can't there? You know, because they can. <laughs> like, everyone, it's like, can I go to the bathroom? <laughs> Outside. <laughs> 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 yeah, it was it was hard, and and we're in a habit of it being hard, and there may be moments again where it's hard, but I really think that the hard part is over. Thanks. <laughs> <laughs> For, for people who are in this space, or in general? I'm speaking to what's here in the room. Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah. I mean, and, and yeah, truth is a relationship. So I'm not offering a general principle that you can, in the fashion of industry, stamp onto external reality. It's true right here and right now. Yeah. how-to question of um, how to connect desire and purpose. How to connect desire and purpose. Mm. Mm -hmm. I know it's a hidden one. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Well, So there's an intellectual piece that might be helpful, which is to understand that purpose is something that is given to you, not something that you have to generate yourself. And the way that you identify that purpose and receive that and receive that gift and, and, and know what that purpose is is that it stimulates desire. Because that's why you're here. You know, that the purpose is given to you. Like, you're here for this. So, of course, you want to fulfill that purpose. Like, I didn't have to muster any willpower to come here and do this. I, 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 I want to do it. And there might be some obstacles. There might be other desires that will beckon. That, and there might be ways that the desire to be here doing this or your desire to, to enact your purpose is displaced onto other things. That maybe 
over a long habit and through old trauma, you were kind of tricked um, into thinking that that's what you want. But it's not. And you can tell by how you feel after having done it. So, so, if people, so, so basically what I'm saying is that desire actually is what carries you toward purpose. You don't have to fight life. You don't have to fight yourself. But that desire, then you're like, oh, but, but my desire is, you know, to sit in front of the computer watching chess videos all day. <laughs> that's, that's what happens to me sometimes. <laughs> And, and the programming then, the programming of making it hard says that I have to overcome this desire, I have to fight this desire in order to fulfill my purpose. I should be here writing and instead I'm watching these damn chess videos, you know? Or whatever other addiction that you have. And what I've come to recognize is that I'm not, I don't actually want to do this. I'm in some kind of pain here. And my desire has been displaced onto watching chess videos. So what I can do is, for one, I can ask myself, what do I really want? Do I really want to do this? What if, instead of fighting desire, what if I have an a, 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 a indulgence meditation before I do anything? And I'm like, okay, I'm going to do what I want to do the most. No second place, no substitutes. Like, what really is going to feel good? And I might discover that I don't know. And that's, that's why the second part of the practice is really important, which is to fully feel the after effects of anything that you choose. So it's about taking it in, uh, the good and the bad. Like, how do I feel after helplessly going from one chess video to the next to the next? <laughs> after, how do I feel after that? Like, we asked Carrie to do this too. Like, you know, Dad, can I have another cookie? Okay, can I have another cookie? Another cookie? <laughs> and then, like, how do you feel after those four cookies? <laughs> Not that good. <laughs> like, and that's to direct the attention onto the after effect. Because if you don't pay attention to the after effect, how will you ever know in your body what you just took in? And, and so that's also the importance of celebration. Celebration is the integration process of something good. And if you don't, this is, like I'm speaking my own, um, my own neuroses here, like my, Things that I've been discovering in this blessed last couple of years, like, oh gosh, I never allow myself celebration or rarely allow myself celebration. So it's on to the next, on to the next, on to the next. And when I do that, and I don't celebrate, life becomes hard. And I have to make myself do my next responsibility. I have to make myself write my next sense of humanity because I didn't celebrate the first one enough. Life becomes hard when you don't celebrate. And, and it, it, that's like a paradox to the mind that is steeped in separation and the mentality of struggle to say, to say, I will, like this isn't my white privilege here that I'm celebrating and allowing myself this indulgence. Celebration will make me into a more powerful agent of life and beauty and change. I, it will be easy and I won't be uh, proclaiming a principle of life that life is hard and I won't be enacting oppression within myself that is sure to generate oppression in the world around me because the way that we live our lives is a statement of what shall be and this leads to one of the other questions like you know, are the vaccinated going to be, um, of course, uh, put into quarantine camps, concentration camps? 
that that the answer to that question is not outside of ourselves. That's a question that we answer. Will they? What's your answer? Yes or no? I spent a lot of time in Iraq where there was torture going on. Yeah. And I didn't even know that there was torture going on in the building that I was driving back and forth along every day. So what I know now is that there was torture going on all across the country. And it was just for the hell of it. It was just as like a stress release, not really even to get information. So the question that I'm asking is, might something like that happen here? And would our friends and neighbors tolerate the unvaccinated um, going into places where they're uh, trapped in prisons, having harm done to them? I mean, the, the, the whole crucifixion aspect that like, someone faces yeah. trials and then a crucifixion in order to come through into the, the new life. Yeah, so certainly the possibility exists for this to happen, as you well know, because you've seen equivalent things. So you know that it's possible. So is it going to happen? No. I don't know. I, I, I wrote an essay where I... I uh, invoked Elon Musk. And I said, if you ask Elon Musk, what's the future going to be in five years? He'll tell you. He won't say, well, it might be this, it might be that, depending on forces outside myself. He'll be like, oh yeah, I'll tell you what it's going to be in five years. Everyone will have an electric vehicle and there'll be 36,000 low orbit satellites floating around, beaming um, Wi-Fi. Wi-Fi on everybody. <laughs> he does not. So, okay. I don't resonate with many aspects of the future that Elon Musk speaks into existence. But I do recognize in him a certain, um, a certain wisdom. Like, the guy's powerful. And the particular power that he has developed and claims is the power of work. He's not, he doesn't see himself as a victim of circumstances. He's like, I'll say how it's going to be. He's very much in the king archetype. And I'm like, yeah, what can I learn from the guy, you know? Where am I um, abdicating my kingship to an objective reality that I see as beyond myself and see myself helpless in relation to? What aspect of my power am I unwilling to step into and, and hide behind the, I don't know, hide behind, it depends on what other people do. And I'm not saying like, that I can make other people choose any other way than they're choosing. But I recognize, like, in myself, shrinking back from the world when it's like, you know, it's like, like this comes up when we're like, where should we live? You know, should we stay in Rhode Island? Should we move to Texas, you know? Like, <laughs> and, 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 and where we go is like, well, or where I sometimes go is like, okay, well, that depends on what's down the road. If they're going to have vaccination camps, in, you know, they won't have them in Texas, but they might have them in Rhode Island. So let's wait and see if they're going to have them here, and then we'll decide if we're going to go to Texas. And what I'm saying is there's a choice here that I'm unwilling to make. There's a choice that I, some part of me wants external reality to make for me. And what part of me doesn't want to fully step into choice? It comes down to, um, and I'm not, I'm not necessarily saying that you're like me, okay? But I'm just, I think maybe my experience might be useful. It's like, really it's like, what part of me is unwilling to be fully incarnated here? And to say... Here, because I am incarnated. I have a body, I have a mind, I have hands. I can arrange things. I can take up space in the world. I can dig holes and build big buildings, and I can do things, you know? I have 
I, because of my incarnation, I have power, as all of us do. And I had a lot of training and a lot of trauma that made me unwilling to step into that power, that made me want to shrink back from the world, that made me reject myself as an incarnate being because look at all the harm that men are causing in the world and I'm a man. Look at, all, look at all the harm that human beings are causing in the world and I'm a human being. So to shrink back from my gifts as a creator. And that's why I've been exploring, like stepping fully into my power, including the power of my word. But it's really like, like daring, for me, it's daring to take up space in the world and to be fully here in the world. And to say, yeah, here's how it's going to be. Are there going to be concentration camps for the unvaccinated? No. There are not. There are not. It's not going to happen. Why? Because I said so. We're not going to let it happen. <laughs> it's kind of happening in Australia, though, already, in, in China. Um, they're really, you know, messing with people there. But we, you know, like America is a whole other reality, you know, and it's probably because of our Second Amendment that it's not happening in these other countries. You know, so yeah. like um, Elon said that um, that government um, is is uh, has the legal power to create uh, to manifest murder on a large scale. I'll tell you what's going to happen in China. Yeah, what's going to happen in China is that the degree of the oppression and the insanity is going to cause eventually the most inspiring all like the most awe-inspiring reversal yeah, that see. you can imagine yeah yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah yeah and you can feel the possibility of this mm -hmm. so so when i say here's what's going to happen because i said so it is that doesn't mean, okay, I said so, now I sit back and don't do anything about it. <laughs> That's not how the power of word works. It's an invitation. It's a reminder. And we are, we are aligning, so there's a possibility out there. There's many possibilities. We're in the garden of forking paths. We're at the, the crossroads. These timelines radiate out into the future. And there's one of those timelines. You look down that road, and you can see those concentration camps. And you look down another road, and you can see something luminous. Beautiful. Like you know all of these are possible. And they are possible not in the sense of let's roll the dice and make it. They're possible in the sense of I have agency here. It's possible if I align myself with that future. And you have special gifts, actually. Um, the gift of your time in Iraq. So you are, the reason that this question is eating at you, the reason that it's causing you anguish, the reason that you feel such dismay when you see each step down that pathway is because you cannot rest easy as that happens. Because your gift and your purpose and your desire calls you to do something about it. And that's why it bothers you so much. And, 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 that, and so there's, I, I don't know what that is, what is yours to do, but, you know, it may not be some big, grand, loud thing, but you are definitely part of the no, this is not going to happen. You have, you have, your experiences give you a certain clarity and a certain uh, emphasis. Like, you can say that no more emphatically than others because of the, um, gift of your past. So, yeah. Uh, 
not engage in divisiveness while standing firm in my truth. You have to get clear on the motive for your divisiveness. And the, the, the motive, like when you are divisive, um, and like what's actually happening there. And we're going to talk about choir. There might Yeah, so, so I can't like project and also say this in the right way. <laughs> Yeah. And, and, and the motive for why, why don't you want to be divisive? Because I don't want to lose the foundation of what feels like the highest ideal. Unity and love, compassion and understanding. Yeah, so I, I would say to locate the origin of your secret contempt for others. If it, to the extent that it exists, and I'm not saying you're an especially contemptuous person, but uh, divisiveness comes from judgment. It comes from categorizing, I'm saying in yourself, right? Like, I mean, I feel it. I feel like this surge of contempt when like, I see people doing like the most idiotic, harmful stuff. Like, and there's this programmed response of contempt. Like they're morons, they're idiots, they're, they're blind, they're sheep, you know? Like, and I recognize that, that that contempt gets in the way of understanding that. It's not the truth. Whatever judgment I have is not the truth. The truth is that, you know, once upon a time they were as cute and intelligent as that baby, and sweet, and open to the world, and um, something happened to them. So when I feel that, like I, 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 there's, I feel something underneath, like that surge of righteousness. Something hurts, you know, because when I uh, hold someone in contempt, I'm also holding myself above them. I'm saying I deserve respect. I deserve love. I'm one of the good people. I'm one of the smart people. I'm one of the moral people. I'm one of the responsible people. I'm one of the conscious people. I'm one of the spiritual people. And it doesn't mitigate that to say, and I'm going to be nice to the people who are less conscious. Like that kind of, that's patronizing. That's, you know, patronizing. It's indulgent, you know. Um, it's more like... It's like, what is blocking the truth of our brotherhood? What hurts here? Like, why, why do I have the need to construct categories that make me feel superior? Like, where have I not received unconditional love? You know? So anyway, like, long roundabout thing. Um, I would say the how. See, and again, it's not really a how. If I could frame it as how, I would say work on unconditionally loving yourself. Like find a place where you don't. Find a place where you only 
dole out some self-love if you're being good, if you're worthy of it. But you can't love yourself by force. I can't say love yourself just as I can't say love her or love him. Love Joe Biden, love Donald Trump. Like, and the reason that I, that I can't say that is that you actually already do. And what? I'm aware of uh, yeah. like an agenda in it of um, or just like with the question, how do I be of greatest service? And there's like feels like there's like a little bit of a tipping more towards like the energy, the archetype of like freedom fighter. And don't tread on me. From like, all right, it's universal love. I just want, and, I, and I'm aware of the ego that wants to be loved and wants to be, you know, I don't want, you know, like you were saying, like that it's painful when people project their judgment on us, especially when we go in without a mask or things like that. And so I'm aware of that, that piece of wanting, not wanting to be unloved. Um, but there's also the sincere, like, how do I be of greatest service? Do I just stay anchored in, like, what a lot of my satsang teachers would be? Just, like, it's, it's, there's only the self, you know, don't play too much in Maya, you know, in the dream. But, but there's more, like, wanting to, to take a stance. And so that's where there's just, like, the uncertainty. How do I do both? And it's just a matter of, like, looking at the agenda, like, oh, how could I reach the most people? Like these, my own egoic projections of what needs to happen. And um, so, yeah, I'm not sure where that on that. Yeah, and, and, and maybe I'll, maybe, um, you know, maybe it's not going to come out in this moment either, but I mean, I have this question too. You know, when I when I write stuff, like for me, it's like, how do I like affirm that those who are not masking and not vaccinating are sane and say, yeah, it's fine. Like, like resist without othering those who are doing those things, yeah. and then receiving it as a criticism. And I find that that like. Yeah, I, I can do that through humor. I can do that through preempting that that idea. But ultimately, my words will carry a different resonance if I'm really seated in the place of of love, of unconditional love, of welcome, of solidarity. Uh, and my ability to do that comes down again to: Am I doing it internal? Yeah, my love in those little parts. Yeah, and it's such, it's turning up the heat to, to, to stand firm and to, 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 to shield the projections that are likely to come and that I've seen coming as the volume of the voice yeah. gets louder. Yeah. And so it's just like curriculum upgrade. Yeah. 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 Maybe, maybe one more thing and then I'll tell you a little story and then we can move on to the next. I think we're probably getting close to time. Yeah. yeah. So as this uh, story continues to unfold, um, I feel like you know, the, kind of the ridiculousness of the narrative is just exposing itself. And um, I feel this, I told you so, this huge lifelong of I told you so, just welling up inside of me. And I'm like, I don't want to feed that wolf because I want to hold space for people to change their minds. And if I'm offering resistance, to that, I'm not part of the solution anymore, I'm part of the problem. So, and I know the idea, you know, you talked on the Aubrey Marcus podcast about amnesty, but where's the accountability? You know what I mean? There's so much suffering, and there's kids, and it's just like, yes. Yeah. So what does accountability actually mean? Does it have a meaning besides punishment? <laughs> Yeah, I'm sure that we're going to have to sacrifice on the altar vindication 
Like that makes it harder for people to change their mind. If not only do they have to change their mind, but also they have to like grovel. Yeah. Yeah. You know? <laughs> and, and and admit that they were wrong. Like for me, like it would be enough for me for the pedophilia elite to just never do it again. That's enough for me. If they don't get punished, I'm okay with that. I mean, there's definitely part of me that wants to see them punished, you know, and wants to like dance over their defeated, groveling bodies. But, <laughs> you know, like, really, is that what I want to serve? Yeah. And, and maybe it looks like you can serve both. Maybe it looks like the things that will bring them to justice will also be the things that make it stop. But at some point, you cannot serve two masters. At some point, you will be asked to choose which one you serve. And I would like to put a word in for choosing, let's have it stop. Even if they get off scot-free, and all of them, Gates and Fauci and, and like what if they get off scot-free but all of this ends? I'm okay with that. And, I'm, and I, we have to be okay with that because otherwise we're feeding the, the wolf of domination. You know, that takes over. And then we end up with, you know, a revolution just like all the others where we become the new oppressors because we're serving victory rather than healing. But it's a tough one. Yeah, and what does accountability mean when it doesn't mean punishment? I would replace it with transparency. Mm -hmm. Accountability means the settling of accounts. Um, it means, like, in the old towns, the economy worked through accounts, uh, not through currency. People would keep track of you know, who owed how much to whom. And then at a certain time, maybe the end of the year, at some point, everybody would take all the tally sticks and all the ledgers and stuff and figure out, and then only then would some money exchange hands to, to settle everything. So basically, the accounting is bringing into public visibility all of the debts and gifts. And so I would, I would offer that as a replacement for punishment. Yeah, I'm, I'm really with you on all this about accountability. It seems to me there's an important role for restorative restoration, like restorative justice, not retributive justice. That if Gates and Fauci and whoever else got off scot-free, I'm fine with that. But it seems like if there's not an opportunity to come together and talk about the impact of harms and our experiences, everybody, yeah. Then it's incomplete. Like, That's part of the accounting. I mean, it's, it's to make all these things visible. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Truth and reconciliation. Yeah, yeah, exactly. yeah. The restorative yeah, yeah. part. Yeah. yeah, for sure. Yeah, that's part of accountability. Yeah. And, and maybe, you know, maybe we do seize their assets. <laughs> 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 but, but, you know, um, but that's, but again, not in the interest of punishment. Right? And it's so hard. I mean, like, prisons originally were a reform movement. They weren't supposed to be punishment. They were supposed to be a place where you, where, where you, they were, and even some of the words, reformatory, penitentiary, you know, to, to be penitent, to think about what you've done. Um, so there's, there is, like, a, a thread of this. Okay, so um, maybe I'll, I'll finish with a little story. Um, and maybe maybe someday we'll become a graphic novel or something like that, or a little <laughs> <laughs> it's a short story. Yeah. So um, the world man, the world man. You can almost see a tarot card of the world man. <laughs> He um, encounters Gaia, and Gaia is dying. She says, I'm, I am the feminine spirit of this earth, and I'm departing, because I can't sustain any more damage. It's already too late. You've destroyed.
destroyed me. You've taken more than I can give. And as I depart, when I depart, all life on earth will gradually perish. Everything will come apart, everything will unravel. Ecosystems will simplify and simplify and simplify. The trees will die, the insects will die, everything will die. And it's already too late to keep me here. And the world man is stricken with grief and remorse. And she says, there is hope, though, for a new life. There's another spirit who wants to come animate Earth. And she is, her name is Tara. But she will no longer be your mother. This will not be your mother, Mother Earth. She will be lover Earth. You will no longer simply take from her, but as a lover, you will give as you receive, and you will co-create together, and you will know that as your role in relation to each other. And if and when she comes to Earth and suffuses Earth with her being, life on this planet will be restored even more than it ever was. Life will flourish to an even greater degree than ever. And the world man says, great, I'm game, when's the wedding? And Gaia says, well, she's not really sure if she wants to come. She's not sure if you're ready. She's not sure if you're mature. You have to actually demonstrate your readiness and willingness to serve life and to co-create. A courtship, a courtship is necessary. Everything, anything that any human being does in service to life and beauty on Earth is part of the courtship. Any act that you do, any garden, any community service project, anything in service to life and beauty is received by Tara as a gift, as a courtship gift. And when she receives enough of them, she will say yes. Let the courtship begin. Yeah. And, and, and so, so, so much gratitude for this gathering here. Um,